Hey there, and welcome back to another video on Englishes around the world. Today, our journey around the world takes us to Australia and to New Zealand, so we're talking about English down under. The plan for this video is that I'll start with just a few details on how English came to Australia and New Zealand, which was in the late 18th century. So English down under is a relatively recent affair of roughly the past 200 years. The central part of today's video will focus on the main phonological patterns of Australian English and New Zealand English, and specifically how you can tell the two apart. Yeah? What sounds distinguish Aussie English and Kiwi English? Stick around and find out, because at the end we'll have four mystery speakers that you can try and identify as either Australian English speakers or New Zealand English speakers. Now, fair warning, uh, Aussie English and Kiwi English have a good number of features in common, so this is not going to be easy. However, there are a few telltale signs that you can look out for, and that will make it possible for you to make an educated guess. If you're ready, let's go. So, how did English come to Australia and New Zealand? English Down Under is a consequence of the so-called second diaspora that also started American English. If you haven't watched the last video in this series, which was about American English, there's a link in the description below. Check it out. Yeah? American English started out a little earlier than English Down Under. The first settlements in Newfoundland and along the Atlantic coast were set up in the late 1500s, early 1600s. Australia came a lot later, at the end of the 1700s. Still, America and Down Under have a number of things in common when it comes to English and how it is spoken. Both America and Australia are so-called settlement colonies that involve the large-scale relocation of people who are of English ancestry and who are settling permanently in overseas areas. So this gives us a very specific sociolinguistic setting. We have settlers who are originally from different areas of the metropolis, the source country, if you like. So they are speakers of English and they are mostly in contact with other speakers of English. So they're not in a situation of bilingualism or multilingualism. Rather, there are several varieties of the same language that come together and that bring about a new variety. Settlement colonies reshuffle the social networks of their incoming speakers. So these settlers arrive in new settings and they are in contact with speakers of English who are using different dialects. And if you've watched the earlier videos in this series, you know that the linguistic consequence of this process is what's called coinization or dialect leveling. In concrete terms, uh, speakers adopt a linguistic compromise. Settlers with different dialects develop a common variety and features that are shared across the participating dialects, they are maintained and other features that have dialect specific characteristics, they have a greater chance of being lost or being replaced by something that is used more widely. Okay, so this motivates the recognition of Australian English and also American English as high contact L1 varieties. It's not different languages that are in contact, but different dialects, different varieties. Now, in the case of Australian English, this process of dialect leveling has been even more extreme than in America. In Britain, we have accents that change from one street to the other. In America, we have broad areas such as the inland north, the south, the west, and Canada. And I'm afraid for Australia and for New Zealand, I can't really point you to a nice resource that would represent how these varieties split up into different areas. Australian English and New Zealand English have internal variation. So speakers from Sydney, for example, sound a little different than speakers from Brisbane. But ultimately, geography is a relatively minor factor when it comes to variation in Australia and in New Zealand. So in Australia and New Zealand, linguistic variation runs much more along the lines of social status than along the lines of geography. Yeah, this is important to keep in mind. Right, so here are a few basic cornerstone dates of English in Australia. 
The British were actually not the first European colonizers to make it to the Australian continent. The Dutch were there a lot earlier, but they decided not to set up a permanent presence. So almost another 200 years went by before the British arrived with Captain Cook's first voyage. If you're into explorer stories, you will have heard the name James Cook. Yeah, it's that guy that uh, came to Australia. So Cook reached southeastern Australia on April 1770, and he's actually responsible for the name New South Wales, which is where a prison colony was established. We have some records of the provenance of the convicts who came from Ireland and from England. But of course, Australia was not just a prison system, but it, would also, it was also a destination for settlers who started arriving around 1850, not least because gold had been found. So that made it very interesting. Australia gave itself a federal government in 1901 under the name of the Federation of the Commonwealth of Australia, which was a union of self-governing British colonies. If you're interested in the early colonialist history of Australia, there's a historical novel that I can actually recommend to you, namely uh, Kate Granville's The Secret River. I can't really say I enjoyed the book because much of it is really heartbreaking. But what I can say is that I, I vividly remember it and it's been quite a while since I've read it. So this book tells the story of a British convict who comes to Australia, serves his time and then builds up a life after his term in prison. And what I found especially memorable are the encounters between the settlers and the Aborigines who are being evicted from their land. So. The book has very vivid descriptions of violence and terror. So don't say I didn't warn you. It's a great book, though. Check it out. Moving on, I've said that we have some idea of where the settlers came from in England, Scotland and Ireland. So the features of today's Australian English come from the varieties that were spoken by these settlers. However, I already said that coinization has been very thorough in Australia so that social divisions are much more important than these regional differences of the early settlers. So where you came from mattered less in Australia than whether you were inside or outside the prison. So this has repercussions even for present day Australia, where a common distinction that you will find in the linguistic literature distinguishes three sociolects, namely broad Australian English, general Australian English, and quote unquote cultivated Australian English. And this is essentially a continuum from a variety that is standard-like, yeah, that would be the cultivated variety, to varieties that are more and more removed from the standard and that carry less overt prestige. Right. So with all that in mind, uh, let's move on to English in New Zealand, which has been, uh, well, New Zealand has been home to Polynesian Maoris for more than 700 years. And when James Cook came to Australia, he actually made a stop in New Zealand first. The crucial difference being that it was Australia that was selected as the place for a prison colony whereas New Zealand started out as a settlement for fishers and whalers and a set of trading posts that were set up. Now, predictably enough, there were continuous conflicts between the settlers and the Maori population, which were, however, settled in the so-called Waitangi Treaty between the British Crown and over 400 Maori chiefs. This treaty uh, it's really interesting. I encourage you to Google it and check it all out. Yeah. So this treaty represents something of a founding document for New Zealand. Um, what's in that treaty? Well, among other things, the treaty gives the British crown all rights and powers of sovereignty. So the queen is the boss, yeah, essentially. But at the same time, the Maori chiefs retain their chieftainships meaning that their land cannot be taken away by anyone else. Um, the Maori people are further given the rights and protections of British subjects. And 
A year after signing the treaty, New Zealand became a separate British settlement colony. And in 1856, it formed its own government, while of course still being under the governance of the British crown. Now, uh, not too surprisingly, the settlers that brought English to New Zealand, um, they had the same origins as the early settlers in Australia. But for New Zealand, we even know the rough percentages, so that uh, roughly 49% came from England, 22% from Scotland, 20% from Ireland, and 7% they came directly from Australia, so they had been settlers there first. I mentioned that in Australia there is a distinction between different social layers of Australian English, and in New Zealand this is quite similar. So in the literature you'll see people make the distinction between broad and cultivated New Zealand English. Right, that's all the background you're going to get from me today, so let's move on to linguistics and more specifically the sounds of Australian English and New Zealand English. What do these varieties sound like and how can we distinguish between the two? Let's start with Australian English and of course I brought you an example. Let's listen to this text. I'll hit play and we'll listen to it together. So with children, uh, we, we learned that children think differently to adults. Um, so that's how we started thinking, well, how do they think? What's in their world? What, do, what, what are they interested in? And we put those in songs or, uh, you know, they're learning about moving their bodies, but let's make it so they so, do songs that uh, challenge them to move their bodies and enjoy it, you know. Can you point your fingers and do the twist? Yeah, I can try that. Okay. Let's listen to this once more. So with children, uh, we, we learned that children think differently to adults. Um, so that's how we started thinking, well, how do they think? What's in their world? What, do, what, what are they interested in? And we put those in songs or, uh, you know, they're learning about moving their bodies, but let's make it so they so, do songs that uh, challenge them to move their bodies and enjoy it. You know, can you point your fingers and do the twist? Yeah, I can try that. Okay. So there are a couple of sounds that I'd like to draw your attention to. And the first of these is the kit vowel. Okay. You've seen these uh, vowel diagrams before. If you haven't, check out the earlier videos in this series. So the kit vowel is uh, the vowel that we find here. It's a high front vowel. And in Australian English, it is further fronted then you would find it in, let's say, British English or American English. So the kit vowel obviously is the vowel that you find in the word kit, but also in the words fish and chips, think, bin, and so on and so forth. So our speaker uses the word twist, which is where you can hear this very nicely. So let me, let me play this to you and look out for the word twist. Can you point your fingers and do the twist? I'm gonna play it again. Can you point your fingers and do the twist? Okay, so when I say twist, well, it sounds like that, twist. But uh, our speaker here uh, pronounces it more like twist. Yeah, I'll play it again, just so you can make sure. Can you point your fingers and do the twist? Yeah, okay, so this is kit fronting, and that's a very characteristic feature of Australian English. Uh, for me personally, fronted kit is really the telltale sign that I'm talking to a speaker of Australian English and I can only recommend it to you to, to listen out for this feature. Moving on, um, Australian English has more vowels that are fronted and here we're looking at the mouth diphthong. You remember from the video on British Englishes, yeah, we looked at the Scottish realization of mouth and uh, here we have something similar. The starting point of mouth in Australian English is not a low a, ah, but rather a more fronted a. Eh, yeah? So it starts in the territory of the trap vowel. And you can hear this, for example, when our speaker pronounces the word how, yeah? which is not how exactly, but more like how. Uh, I'm gonna try and play this and you can listen to it. How do they think? How do they think? How do they think? How do they think? Okay, so this is how do they think. 
And to me, it really sounds like, how do they think? How do they think? How do they think? How do they think? Yeah. So whenever this happens, uh, that is mouth fronting. The ow diphthong starts a little more in the front than you would hear it, let's say, in British English. Right. Um, a third feature is the lowering of the face diphthong. So when I say face, I start with an e eh and I move up to an i. Yeah, so that gives me face. And in Australian English, the starting point of the diphthong is lowered. Okay, so if you'd like, you can think about it in this way that the diphthong is stretched. So it starts with a mixture of an a ah and an a. Ah, yeah, and that gives you face rather than face. Yeah, you can try this for yourself. Say face and then make the starting point lower and lower and lower until you get to something like face. Okay, uh, let's listen to what our speaker does here. Let's make it. Let's make it. Let's make it. Okay, the speaker says let's make it, but it sounds more like let's mic it. Let's make it. Let's make it. Let's make it. Okay, it's not quite mic. It's not quite make. It's in between. Yeah, it starts somewhere in the trap vowel territory. Let's make it. Let's make it. That is the lowering of face. Um, there's another diphthong that changes in the front, uh, and that is the price vowel. Now, um, face was stretched out, and for price, the opposite is happening. The price diphthong is compressed. Uh, its starting point actually doesn't change, but its end point is a lot lower. So this is almost like I monophthongization, which I talked about in the video on American English, except that this here is not quite a monophthong, a single vowel, but there is some upward movement from an a to an a. Yeah? So it's not price, but it's more like pras. Yeah? Starts with an a, goes to an a, pras. Uh, let's listen to our speaker. Yeah, I can try that. Yeah, I can try that. Yeah, I can try that. Okay, the word is try, and it's not try, it's try. Yeah, I can try that. Yeah, I can try that. Okay, now you hear it. So the lowering of face and the lowering of price, they actually go together because if you lower face, it sounds more like price, yeah, the vowel. And so price has to change in order to keep the distinction between face and price. And so that's how you end up with one diphthong that is stretched and another diphthong that is compressed. There's one more vowel feature that I want to mention. Uh, let me see here. And uh, that is the diphthongization of the fleece vowel. In Australian English, there's quite some variation with regard to the realization of the fleece vowel. And I actually talked about this in the very first video of this series, so you might want to go back and check that out. But uh, one characteristic realization of the fleece vowel in Australian English is the breakup of fleece into an onset vowel that is more of an e, eh, and that then moves up to an e. Let's listen to our speaker here and what, uh, what is happening here. Please. Okay, so this is another speaker because in the um, in the text that uh, I had of the main speaker, there wasn't a good fleece uh, example, but this is a different one, also from Australia, and she is uh, producing the word pleased. Please. Okay, and it really sounds more like pleased. Please. Yeah, but it's meant to be an e, yeah, the fleece vowel, diphthongization of fleece. You'll hear that a lot in Australian English. Okay, so also this is connected to the two other diphthongs that are in the front of the vowel diagram. So basically in Australian English, there's this chain of front diphthongs that make it really, really characteristic. Fleece is diphthongized so that it sounds more like a face. Yeah, Face then is lowered that it sounds more like I, like price. And price is lowered too, so that it sounds more like price. So if you memorize it like that, you don't have to remember all three features separately. 
you can see their connections. Yeah? So just start with the diphthongization of fleece and then work your way down um, with uh, <coughs> face and price and you have all the three features memorized. Right, now of course Australian English does not only have characteristic vowel features, also the consonants are doing interesting things. Uh, one characteristic feature is T flapping, the realization of T between vowels as a flap. Let's listen to what our speaker does here. That's how we started. That's how we started, yeah? So it's not started, it's started. It's not butter, it's butter. It's not important, it's important. It's not computer, it's computer. That is T flapping. One thing that is perhaps too obvious to even recognize, but nonetheless, I want to mention it, that's that Australian English is a non-rhotic variety. So there's no post-vocalic R. Uh, we just heard this in started. So let me play this again. That's how we started. That's how we started. That's how we started. Yeah. And the same in important computer, things like that. Okay. So that gives you an overview of some of the most recognizable Australian English sound features. Um, let's compare this to the sounds of New Zealand English. Here's an example that I'd like you to listen to. And uh, you will find it easy to hear that this is an example of the so-called cultivated New Zealand English variety. Let's listen to this. I think it's a question of not if but when, but the time is not now. In the opinion surveying done on it, about 40% are saying, yes, New Zealand should become a republic, but of course that leaves about 60% uh, who are not saying that. Now, in time, I think there will be a generation which will address the issue of New Zealand having its head of state uh, formally based in New Zealand. But Kiwis are kind of practical people. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, is the general attitude. Uh, their attitudes, I think, towards the present Queen are, are very benign. And okay. Um, I think you caught a few features already that stand out. Um, let's listen to this again. And after that, we'll go through the individual sounds that make this similar to Australian English and different from Australian English. Let's listen. I think it's a question of not if, but when, but the time is not now. In the opinion surveying done on it, about 40% are saying, yes, New Zealand should become a republic, but of course that leaves about 60% uh, who are not saying that. Now, in time, I think there will be a generation which will address the issue of New Zealand having its head of state uh, formally based in New Zealand. But Kiwis are kind of practical people. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, is the general attitude. Uh, their attitudes, I think, towards the present Queen are, are very benign. And Okay, so you will have noticed that there are a couple of similarities to Australian English. The variety is non-rhotic, so no post-vocalic Rs. There is T-flapping, so it's attitudes, not attitudes. There is recognizable lowering of face to face, yeah? so um, head of state, yeah? not head of state, head of state. Um, and um, mouth is fronted to mouth. So all of these features, Australian English and New Zealand English, have in common. And that makes it quite difficult to distinguish between the two if you're not 100% sure. Now, uh, at the same time, there are also important differences that I want to talk about. One very distinctive feature is the raising of e eh in words such as pen. Okay, so this is the, the dress vowel uh, that is being raised. And from the video on American English, you remember maybe uh, that there's a thing called the pin-pen merger. So speakers who pronounce the word pen as pin. This here is similar, but not quite, okay? It's not a merger. In New Zealand English, the i does something else. So the two sounds are not the same, they're not merged, they're different. Um, let's listen to the pronunciation of our speaker with regard to the vowel that we have in pen. About 40%, about 40%, about 40%.
about 40 percent. Okay, the word here is percent, and she doesn't say percent. She says percent. Up 40 percent. Up 40 percent. Up 40 percent. Up 40 percent. So this is quite characteristic. You'll hear this a lot, and that is a very characteristic telltale sign that you are hearing a speaker of New Zealand English. Okay, um, so eh is raised, and I said that uh, the i, the kit vowel, is doing something else, namely it is centered. This is another highly distinctive feature of New Zealand English. Kit moves towards the center of the vowel space and comes out somewhat more like kut. Yeah? This is not really a full-scale u, uh, it's just more centered. Let's listen to our speaker pronouncing the word fix. Okay, When I say fix, uh, you hear a kit vowel. Um, the speaker says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I want you to listen out for the fix. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. 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 Okay, so you hear that the kit vowel is not quite there in the front. It's centered. Yeah, it sounds a bit, um, yeah, more like an uh than an i. Uh. Um, okay, do you remember what happened to kit in Australian English? There it was fronted, right? So this is a feature where Australian English and New Zealand English move in opposite directions. And that makes it one of the features to look out for when you want to distinguish the two varieties. So um, kit is centered, dress is raised to kit, and that means that in the space where dress was, there is now a vacuum, so to speak, and that is where we find another distinctive feature of New Zealand English, namely the raising of trap, which sounds more like dress. Okay, so trap is raised. Let's listen to the way our speaker pronounces the word attitude. Listen to the initial vowel, okay? When I say attitude, I produce a trap vowel, and our speaker does this here. Attitude, 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 attitude. Okay, that's attitude, not attitude. Um, right, so we have these three vowel changes going on in the front of the vowel space, and you can actually think of them as something of a clockwise movement. Okay, so trap goes up, E is raised to I, and then I moves in center, pretty much like the hand of a clock that starts around seven and then goes around, yeah? Okay, uh, one final feature, which is the raising of the falling diphthong square, yeah? Square, um, the crucial part of it is E, yeah? Um, now, um, in Australian English, this uh, air diphthong gets a higher starting point, which is why it's also called the near square merger. So if you try to pronounce the word square with the diphthong that you have in near, you get something like square. Yeah? So that's how a New Zealand English speaker would pronounce the word square. And it's not just called the near square merger, it's also called the uh, chia chair merger, because if you ask a New Zealand speaker what you see in these pictures here, you get two times the same answer. Yeah, they're cheers. <clears throat> okay, so that's the near square merger or the chia chair merger. And uh, now we're getting to the moment of truth. Can you hear whether a speaker is an Aussie English speaker or a Kiwi English speaker. Let's see. Um, features to look out for? Well, I've mentioned a couple of features that are common to both varieties, like T flapping, the lowering of face and price, and the fronting of mouth. Um, where it gets interesting are these differences. So the fleece vowel, Australian speakers diphthongize it. If you hear that, that's a good telltale sign. Kit is a very important vowel to look out for because in Australian English it's fronted, in New Zealand English it's centered, and um, essentially every 
uh, student presentation of Australian English and New Zealand English has an obligatory element, namely that you have to pronounce fish and chips once in Australian. So that would be fish and chips. And once in New Zealand English, that would be fish and chips. And uh, this is something that you need to look out for. Okay, and then the pen uh, vowel, so the, the dress vowel, which is raised in uh, New Zealand English. So it's, it's pin and win and question and uh, so on and so forth. Right, are you ready? If you are, let's start with our first mystery speaker. I'm going to hit play. So big data is, well, it's quite big. And indeed today, it cuts across many different industries and wraps itself around the world. Indeed, big data is so ubiquitous that it's decoupled itself from the very technology that once drove it. The databases and the machine learning, machine learning algorithms much less important today than the actual philosophical outlook. And when we talk about big data now, we're really talking about a philosophical outlook that embraces empiricism. OK, I heard a bunch of features. so. Let's listen to this again. You can also pause the video, move back and forth if you want to listen to it more often. I'm going to play it one more time. So big data is, well, it's quite big. And indeed today it cuts across many different industries and wraps itself around the world. Indeed, big data is so ubiquitous that it's decoupled itself from the very technology that once drove it. The databases and the machine learning, machine learning algorithms much less important today than the actual philosophical outlook. And when we talk about big data now, we're really talking about a philosophical outlook that embraces empiricism. Okay, have you made up your mind? Uh, if you have, let's move on to mystery speaker number two. Had a few more beers and I had, the conversation turned to 70s fashion <laughs> and how everything manages to come back into style. There's a few more beers so there has to be some stuff that hasn't come back. <laughs> then one more beer and it was, whatever happened to the moustache, why hasn't that made a comeback? <laughs> so there's a lot more beers and then the day ended with a challenge to bring the moustache back. Okay, we need to listen to this once more. Had a few more beers and I had, the conversation turned to 70s fashion and how everything manages to come back into style. There's a few more beers, so there has to be some stuff that hasn't come back. <laughs> then one more beer and it was, whatever happened to the moustache, why hasn't that made a comeback? <laughs> so there's a lot more beers and then the day ended with a challenge to bring the moustache back. Okay, Aussie or Kiwi? Let's move on to mystery speaker number three. How do you know what I like? If I'm your audience, how do you know? Well, that's a very, very good question and it's constantly changing. The answer to that is always changing. Number one, you've got to be open to the answer. You can't just be completely dictatorial when it comes to choosing records and making, especially if you have free playlists. It's all the more important if, if, if you're told you don't have to adhere to a station-wide music policy that you make your choices with respect out of what we think you guys are into. You guys are into? Yeah, I think I know. I'll play this again. How do you know, How do you know what I like? If I'm your audience, how do you know? Well, that's a very, very good question, and it's constantly changing. The answer to that is always changing. Number one, you've got to be open to the answer. You can't just be completely dictatorial when it comes to choosing records and making, especially if you have free playlists. It's all the more important if, if, if you're told you don't have to adhere to a station-wide music policy that you make your choices with respect out of what we think you guys are into. Okay. That brings me to mystery speaker number four, the last one. Let's play. Um, we're just, um, he'd done a radio edit for tomorrow, the first time we actually released it. So we knew him from there and he was just, he had a lot of really good ideas and we wanted to experiment a lot more on the second album and he was like a mad scientist. So we thought, you know, he'd have some ideas. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, let's listen to it again. Um, we're just, 
Um, he'd done a radio edit for Tomorrow, the first time we actually released it. So we knew him from there and he was just, he had a lot of really good ideas and we wanted to experiment a lot more on the second album and he was like a mad scientist so we thought, you know, he'd have some ideas. Okay, excellent. Um, if you've got your notes and you've got your guesses, we can move on to uh, the mystery speaker reveal. Yeah, so here's the first one. <clears throat> Who is a Kiwi? Yeah, uh, Sean Gawley, a physicist. Uh, the sound example I took from an interesting TED talk that he has given. And among the features that we hear in his speech, we have the famous centered kit vowel. So this is him pronouncing the word empiricism. 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 No, it's empiricism. Empiricism. Okay, I'm not arguing with a physicist. Uh, and of course we have raised pen. Mini, 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 mini. Okay, it's mini. Mini. It's called, it's pronounced many. Mini. Many. Mini. Okay, there we go. So mystery speaker number one, Kiwi. Here we have mystery speaker number two. Um, you've, you must have heard the word Movember before. Yeah, so that's the gentleman behind that operation. And uh, in his speech, we hear the fronted Kit and uh, Lord Pras. Yeah, so Kit Pras. Um, let's see what he actually says here. In the style. In the style. Okay, into style becomes into style. In the style. Into style. In the style. There we go. Yeah. Mystery speaker number two, Aussie English. Here we have mystery speaker number three, uh, Zane Lowe. <clears throat> uh, used to work for the BBC. I'm not quite sure what he's doing right now. Uh, taught me a lot about music. Um, so he has raised pen. Let's listen to this. Especially. 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 Okay. This is the word especially. And when he pronounces it, it really sounds like specially. Uh, let's listen to this. Especially. Especially. Yeah. So, especially, not especially. And of course, he has T flapping, which is common to both Australian and New Zealand English, but nonetheless. Important. 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 Yeah. That is there too. And this brings me already to mystery speaker number four, our last one. Daniel Johns from um, the band Silverchair. So if you ever run out of Nirvana records, you can listen to Silverchair. That works too. And he has lowered price. Scientist. 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 Yeah, so it's not science, but it's science. Scientist. Scientist. And uh, here we have a nice example of the diphthongized fleece uh, vowel. Uh, let, me, let me play this. Release. Release. So it's released. Release, 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 release. Yeah. So not it's just not one monophthong released, but it's released. Yeah. And that is what uh, fleece diphthongization is all about. Okay, that's it for this video. I hope you got at least some of the mystery speakers right. I hope you had fun. And of course, I hope that you'll also be there for the next installment in the series of Englishes around the world. Next time we're going to Africa, so that's going to be fun too. And until then, have a good time and I'll see you. Bye.